running for some kind of office here. <laughs> for a speech, I ask you to vote for me. So nowadays, um, I previously I used to give technical presentations about how to program Erlang and new features and things like that. But nowadays I seem to just give presentations about either the history of Erlang or non-technical things like this. I guess there are so many people around now out in the world who uh, write a lot of programs and discover a lot of new usage of Erlang, so it's so hard to keep up. It was better during the days when when this would be all Erlang programmers. <laughs> so this is gonna have <clears throat> this presentation is gonna be the future of of, uh, of our mind. And uh, as it was a little bit tempting to say that, well, no future, let's go to the beer. But uh, <laughs> fortunately, uh, there is a little bit more to tell before we can get to the beer. So let's see. So I guess I've already, uh, uh, already been introduced. My name is Lennart Oerman, if you would like to have another Swedish lesson. Uh, I used to be called uh, Omen, so that's, that's pretty okay. So, there we have my email address, if you want to reach me. Before I go further into uh, introducing myself, someone wrote uh, the synopsis of this presentation and uh, said something about it was going to be truly epic. I started to think about what epic actually meant, and I got a strange feeling that I really didn't exactly know what it meant. Of course, I, I got some kind of intuitive feeling. So I started to look it up, and um, I actually was right in the way that the meaning has changed. First, I looked up in Swedish, and there is a similar Swedish word, so it comes from Greek. It's epic with a K. And there was actually a warning text in Swedish saying that the meaning of epic has changed, mainly due to American influence. So I then, of course, had to go to the source uh, of all knowledge nowadays, Wikipedia. That's what we know we need. Uh, so it says that um, it has evolved, uh, it has left just the, uh, uh, the area of poetry and gone into other things where the story is centered on heroic characters and the action takes place on a grand scale. So I guess at least we can, uh, we're going to talk about the grand scale, we're going to talk about the fall of Berlin from the beginning and until today, and especially then how it's been used within Ericsson. I also stopped by the sentence, um, the real life stories of heroic figures have also been referred to being epic. So we are, sorry about that, we are uh, allowed to use the word epic also for real life stories, not only fictional stories. So I hope it will be really epic. First, the mandatory things about where I come from, Schreland uh, and Tuselius. Then, it's a Swedish company group. I actually, originally we worked with software in the Swedish defense industry. Uh, now we work with a lot of different sorts of software. Of course, not all of these 200 people work with Erlang, uh, but uh, we work with advanced software. And Sherlock Tosilius was founded during the days when, uh, when IT did not mean anything. During the days when you said that you worked with computers. And then of course in the end of the 90s came the IT. And then we had the dot com crash and now you again talk about that you work with computers. So what about myself then? I began, uh, my first acquaintance with Erlang was in uh, 1991. 
three gentlemen walked into a classroom at Uppsala University where I was studying for my master in computer science. Uh, they happened to be named uh, Mike Williams, Joe Armstrong, and Robert Gurdy. To some of you, those names um, are familiar. And uh, these uh, three gentlemen, they wanted to teach us a new programming language they had invented. And you can imagine that we uh, we sat there and thinking, yeah, right, a new programming language, exactly what the world needs. So we were, of course, a bit skeptic, but um, after having done a um, project for uh, one of the semesters at Erlang, uh, programming a distributed telecom switch for Ericsson, uh, many of us uh, were hooked on Erlang. And, uh, well, I've been ever since. In 94, uh, I and a colleague of mine, we started the development of what was going to become OTP. At that time, it was called BOSS. So many of the things like supervisors and, and workers and one for all and those kind of uh, terminology, I'm, I'm partly to blame about that. I also say that I, among uh, one more, another colleague of, my, uh, of mine at Erlang Systems, I have hold the position as an Erlang salesman. I've actually tried to sell a programming language that was before the days uh, of open source. We actually had a few customers. Uh, one of the customers I'm actually going to talk about um, later in this, um, this presentation. Otherwise, I could say that Motorola was actually a customer of ours in those days. In 99, I uh, left Ericsson and uh, joined Sherlock and Tuscelius, where I am still, where I still am. I actually feel a little bit uncomfortable. I'm, uh, I'm going to walk around anyway. At least I need to move around. To tell the story about Erlang, we need to go back into uh, to find out why uh, Erlang was invented. And we actually have to go more than 150 years back to an American. Alexander Graham Bell. He's at least the official inventor of the voice telephone. There are probably numerous stories of competitors who claim to have been before and so on, but if you look once again on the Wikipedia, the source of all knowledge nowadays, Alexander Graham Bell is the official inventor. In those days, how uh, were switches designed? Well, um, the terminology circuit switched was exactly what it was. It was a, it was a physical circuit from your telephone to the other telephone. And the switching was done uh, like this, usually. Uh, rows of ladies doing connections. And uh, uh, the quality system during these days uh, was these, uh, there was these ladies, they were listening in to um, some of the conversations for quality purpose, or at least the conversations where uh, some gossip were likely to be heard. But of course, as uh, the telecom networks grow, uh, this, was, this would not scale. So, someone invented an automatic switch. It was of course, of course all uh, mechanical and that's why we got the rotary dial. Because the rotary, rotary dial just generate pulses which are heard by some fantastic mechanical device that moves arms and uh, more or less actually does what the ladies did in the manual switchboard.
and then there was digital. Ericsson, or more precisely, a joint venture between the Swedish, at that time, uh, monopoly PTT, Televerket, uh, a joint venture between Televerket and Ericsson called LMTEL developed the first world's all digital PBX public switch. Some of you might have heard of it as AXC10, and its first installation was done in 1976. They had to do a lot of proprietary stuff, like a proprietary processor, it was called APSET, and a proprietary programming language called Plex. All of this to fulfill um, performance requirements for the switch. Of course, at this time, uh, this was a great achievement. And a lot of people at Ericsson were, of course, very, very happy and very proud of this. But you cannot sit down and, and uh, wait for the competition to uh, catch up. So some people started to think about how should we do this in the future? How should we program the future telecom switches? Things like what would happen to the hardware, what would happen to operating systems. Also, uh, issues like software crisis that uh, eventually everyone would have to write programs because they would become so complex. So we would need more efficient programming languages to be able to accomplish all of this. And that was things that was, th th these issues were, were uh, thought about and experiments were made by a group called the Computer Science Laboratory at LMTEL. And that is the birthplace of Erlang. So I just want to show you uh, the first minute of a very famous video. Hello, my name is Bjarne Decker and I'm responsible for the computer science laboratory our job, that is to put research to work. Oops. Yes, you may continue. I was trying to increase the volume and um, then he uh, just froze. And our main challenge, that is how to program large real-time systems as efficiently as possible. And after many experiments, we decided that we had to move from conventional high-level languages such as uh, Ada, Chill, C++, etc. into the world of declarative programming. We also found out that the only way to do that, that was to develop our own language uh, and the language which is called Erlang. In this video we'll show you about the properties of this language and how it's been applied in large prototyping projects and also about the potentials of this language for the future. So this was uh, Bjorn Decker and he was the manager of of the computer science laboratory. So in the middle of the of the 80s they started to experiment with this and the result we now know as Erlang. So what this presentation is really going to be about is that um, I want to make a little walkthrough of the Erlang usage within Ericsson today. And the reason I came up with this little idea was that on a couple
couple of blogs on some emailing lists and so on, I noticed that people started to talk about whether Ericsson actually used Erlang at all nowadays, if Ericsson had abandoned Erlang. And of course, I understand that if you're not situated in Sweden and you talk to a lot of colleagues who work at Ericsson with Erlang on a daily basis, it is of course uh, not possible to know. So, I'd like to start with an old favorite of mine, which I've uh, worked on, and where actually this BOSS, the basic operating system that eventually became OTP, was developed for. The mobility server. The mobility server was the first project where Ericsson decided to use Erlang. And this was around 1992. Uh, the experiment started and the productification started in 1994. In short, the mobility server was about intelligent features for office switches. You have to put yourself back into a time where mobile phones were not something that everyone had. Instead, uh, big corporations built systems with uh, at best with decked phones, with uh, cordless phones in their buildings, and everyone had a, um, a business exchange, a private uh, switch, switchboard. So, of course, you wanted to have certain features like uh, call forwarding, you would like to have automated attendance, uh, you would like to have your incoming calls to end up in uh, the, the device where you happen to be at the moment. Could be a stationary phone or a cordless phone. Things that we now take for granted or we just say that why don't you use a cell phone. The first versions were based on the operating system VxWorks. Later, in 97, um, it was decided that the mobility server was going to be renewed and uh, completely redeveloped, and then it was based on Windows NT. In the beginning of the 2000s, uh, Ericsson made a few changes to its um, business, and I guess mainly because the, the segment of business switches um, was going down because the cell phones were picking up and also in some sense IP telephony and things like that. So another company called Ascom Tateco, located in uh, a branch located in Sweden but uh, it is an um, international company, uh, acquired the mobility server in the beginning of the 2000s and uh, continued to develop it and sell it for its purpose. It was discontinued um, somewhere around 2007. The next one, people in the, um, who have been in the Erlang community for some time may have heard of the AXD301. Uh, it was a huge project, uh, an ATM switch. ATM switching was something uh, that was, uh, it was like the, the telecom uh, um, side or the telecom answer to, um, to a packet switched uh, network. Uh, don't ask me about details why ATM was considered better at that time. Uh, in the beginning of the 90s than uh, an IP-only network. But for obvious reasons, it must have been, because a lot of telecom manufacturers uh, started making ATM switches. This development started in uh, 95, approximately, and it probably still holds the record of being the world's largest Erlang 
system it must have. I think that it also claims to be the world's largest functional program as well for industrial use. Uh, ATM switches uh, are not uh, uh, the product of today. Uh, once again, I don't. I cannot explain exactly uh, why the IP networks have taken over. I know that when I when I look this up, uh, in somewhere in 2005, the uh, ATM, uh, some ATM steering group, uh, actually dissolved itself and uh, merged with some. Um, uh, some IP groups instead. So, the AXD301 is today in maintenance mode, but since Ericsson is a big company, of course, all customers who have purchased AXD301s and still operate them uh, should, of course, still receive maintenance and, uh, and uh, uh, necessary upgrades and so on. Another more hidden Ericsson product is called NetSIM. It is hidden in the sense that it is not a product that's sold to, um, to end users. It's more of a tool. It's a node simulator for configuration tools. If you're developing configuration tools, it is, of course, difficult to get your hands on the real hardware that you're going to configure. So a simulator is, is then very, very useful. Actually, the development of this NetSIM was done in C++, C++, uh, C++ in 95, but it was a year later approximately decided to rewrite it in Erlang. Initially it was for the AX, AXE 10 uh, only. Now um, it has somewhere close to 100, it can simulate somewhere close to 100 different node elements. So even though not many have heard of this outside of Ericsson, it is very much still in use. Here is one of my personal favorites, of course, because I have worked with this node. The SGSN and uh, the GGSN, two nodes belonging to uh, the mobile infrastructure. Development started in 1996 because of the packet switch technology known as GPRS. Maybe it's not that no much known here in, uh, in North America, since during these days uh, you had uh, different cellular technologies than we had in Europe. But it was um, in the standardization committees decided on a standard for uh, packet switch data in the GSM network. And that is what sometimes nowadays is referred to as 2.5G. And this requires some nodes for the signaling. And two of those nodes are SGSN and GGSN. And here we can see the SGSN node. I have written here that it has actually survived two network upgrades. And with this I mean that, well, we got the 3G networks, and uh, those are the ones that are depicted here as uh, Utran. The Jiran is the old GSM network. And now, very lately, I don't think anyone can go into a uh, 
an AT&T store and not noticing uh, 4G, which is the flavor of the day. And another name of, of 4G is LTE, long-term evolution. And that's why there's a lot of E's in front of new nodes. E for, for evolution. The GGSN node um, was, uh, the Erlang GGSN node was discontinued a couple of years ago, but the SGSN node is very much alive and, as I said, upgraded for, for uh, new technical standards. More than 2,000 of these uh, SGSN nodes are deployed by Ericsson worldwide. And I guess there are lots of, so to say, non-commercial nodes as well. If you are a telecom operator, you have, you have labs and so on where you need equipment as well to, to test uh, your, your specific features and to test other equipment that you're going to integrate. So what more do we have? Well, um, in the middle of the, uh, the 2000s, Ericsson started a hardware project actually called the Integrated Site. And it was based on uh, some kind of blade server concept. And for the operation and maintenance of, uh, of this integrated site, a special uh, blade was developed uh, called the, the SIS and um, it was programmed in Erlang OTP. The integrated site is uh, now in maintenance mode. So let's see if we can get the night. So it's the same thing as with uh, the AXD301. Ericsson has delivered uh, numerous of these systems and they, of course, they have to be maintained. An application that was, or should we say a board that was, or more, uh, several, uh, several boards actually, that was made for this integrated site was called the Session Border Gateway. Initially, the session border gateway is a, uh, is a pinhole firewall where you open specific ports and you keep track of media streams in and out of, uh, of, a, of a network. So this was initially developed for, um, to fit into this integrated site. Since um, by decision, the integrated site is now in maintenance, uh, and, and the session border gateway is now being evolved to uh, moved to other hardware, uh, something called the common component concept within Ericsson. The session border gateway now also deals more with media streams and have has uh, other features built into it. I'm no expert, so uh, please don't ask me any detailed um, question. What I find interesting and important is that it is uh, an increasingly important part of a network, especially since um, eventually we are probably going to go to voice over uh, packet switched voice in the LTE networks. That's what's called voice over. Uh, LT or VOLT uh, sometimes, and that will drive the, the need for even more of these gateways. And finally, uh, at the first glance, perhaps a little bit of an uh, the bird 
uh, in this. But testing, think about it. Testing is very, very important. Previously, um, I don't know, perhaps it's still, but previously I have a feeling that um, the development community was looking down on testing and it was like it was substandard programmers that, that worked with testing. And I think that nothing can be more wrong. Testing is a very, very important part of your software development, not only during the initial development, but uh, during the entire course of your product. If you can't do regression, proper regression testing and so on, then you're eventually going to break your product. So in around 2006, Ericsson started a new project on how to test the, uh, the radio base stations. This is actually a very large product suite of, uh, of products. If you Google RBS 6000, you will probably find a lot of fancy brochures where you can see a lot of pictures of high and low cabinets and outdoor and indoor cabinets. This is all equipment that is very, very essential to the nowadays very important uh, radio infrastructure. And since this is, I would say, the, uh, the backbone of, um, of Ericsson's uh, business nowadays. So basing, uh, um, the, basing the testing on Erlang OTP is uh, really a, a show of confidence uh, for Erlang OTP. So the funny thing is that nowadays there are like more than 100 programmers sitting and developing test frameworks, tests, cases, and so on in Erlang to, uh, to test uh, these radio base station products. And um, those of you who work with Erlang may be familiar with something called the common test. And that was the reason why common test was added to, uh, to Erlang to support this project. So, we're getting close to answering the question, has Ericsson abandoned Erlang? Well, to me, it's, it feels like there are more usage than ever within Ericsson in a variety of, of um, different areas. And many of the project, uh, products, especially the uh, the SGSN and the testing of the radio base uh, systems uh, is crucial to Ericsson business. While we're at it, I must of course mention a few companies that use, uh, a few non-Ericsson companies that use Erlang in Sweden. Uh, I do not claim this to be a complete list uh, maybe I will get uh, angry emails from from uh, from Swedish companies saying now that well we use Erlang as well, but uh, uh, these are the what I call the usual suspects in um, in Sweden, and I would like to uh, like us to take a look to, into actually the first bullet. Telia Sonora. Telia Sonora is uh, the merger of the Finnish telecom company, the operator Telia Sonora, and the Swedish Telia. And Telia and Sonora are the heirs of uh, the the old monopolies, the PTTs of the diff of those two countries. Telia has a, uh, 
product called Telia Call Guide. Uh, in Finland, it's called Sonora VCC. The development started in 97, and it was a call center solution uh, with servers in Erlang OTP. It was, and it is, based on Windows. In 1998, we at Erlang Systems used this during a promotion campaign as a case study. So uh, this is me, I guess, with some more hair on my head. I did some digging in my old archives, and I found um, the PowerPoint slides. Uh, actually, it was PowerPoint version 4, and that was not compatible with uh, any PowerPoint um, we have today. I ha actually had to find an old computer that I hadn't reinstalled to first uh, uh, open the PowerPoint presentation and convert it to something that I, I, I could read in a modern PowerPoint. So this was how Telia uh, talked about their call guide in 1998. You could see, wow, we have three customers. I'm, I'm sorry, it's in Swedish, but um, we have three customers. So what does it look like now? I couldn't resist um, calling uh, the product manager at Telia for Telia Call Guide, who actually happens to be one of the developers who were programming Telia Call Guide back then in 1997, and asked him for a modern presentation of Telia Call Guide. So I got this. Now they claim to have more than more than 50 percent market share in Sweden and to be in all the Nordic countries. Uh, to have um, 20 million, uh, to have 200 million contacts each year and have 13,000 simultaneous agents handled by these, uh, by these servers. It actually happens to be the case that Telia Call Guide has a competitor. And for just the sake of fairness, I think I should mention them as, as well. Loxisoft, yes, they make call center solutions in Erlang. And no, uh, they are not people who have left Telia or anything like that. Independent of Telia, they started to develop their call center uh, solutions in 2001. And on Erlang OTP using Windows. They have a co somewhat of a different approach. They use Dialogix hardware, I guess, because they don't own their own network and so on. Uh, according to their uh, website, they are one of the major Swedish call center providers. So I guess if we add more than 50% of the market together with one of the major call center providers uh, in Sweden, we come to the conclusion that most of the call center technology in Sweden is covered by Erlang OTP. So, to summarize this, first when I came to think about that I was going to add Telia Call Guide, I got a little bit worried. Uh, what if it actually happened to be that, uh, that a non-Ericsson uh, product would be the, the longest running show, so to speak. But then I, I saw that, no, Telia Call Guide actually started in 97, and uh, the SGSN node started in 1996. So, uh, Ericsson uh, s still holds um, the longest running Erlang product. So a few words about Erlang OTP within Ericsson then. Today, the development of Erlang OTP 
is done by the same group that um, always have worked with, uh, with Erlang. There is some, um, some healthy turnover of people. One or two person uh, leaves every year and uh, the group um, grows. Um, I think it, the term is organically. Uh, by hiring some new people now and then. From an Ericsson um, terminology, it's called common components. Common components are, they, are today some uh, central and important technologies that Ericsson has identified. And just to put Erlang OTP into some kind of, uh, um, of perspective, other programming languages like C, C++, and Java hold the same sta status as a common component. There are also certain operating systems that Ericsson uses and uh, uh, processor boards hardware that's called common components as well. I like to finish this sh uh, short presentation with an example of that Erlang OTP is actually nowadays also openly and actively communicated by Ericsson. Ericsson CEO Hans Westberg uh, made a keynote speech at uh, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas in, now in 2012. And let's see if we can do this. I'm not going to play um, all of this. Don't worry. Okay. Senior Vice President, Industry Affairs, Consumer Electronics Association, Jason Oxman. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2012 International CES. You know, it may not surprise you that the country that gave birth to the Nobel Prize would be a wellspring of innovation. And yet, Swedish technology pioneer Ericsson is not a name typically associated with the consumer electronics industry. Well, today, you're going to see why this innovative 135-year-old company, a global technology leader, is an engine driving our mobile future forward. Ericsson's technology is a foundation for the hardware that makes cell phone networks work. Ericsson also makes the chips that are inside many connected devices, like phones, tablets, and laptops. Ericsson is the inventor of Bluetooth. Based in Stockholm, Sweden, Ericsson is also the world's fifth largest software company and the world's leading provider of technology and services to telecom network operators. Globally, Ericsson handles 40% of telecom network traffic. Lars Magnus Ericsson started his company in 1876 as a telegraph equipment repair business. Today, Ericsson is a leader in 2G, 3G, and 4G mobile technologies, providing support for networks with more than 2 billion subscribers. Ericsson also owns more than 27,000 patents and is the largest holder of essential LTE patents. The company has some 90 license deals with handset companies and infrastructure providers. And by 2020, Ericsson predicts there will be 50 billion connected devices in the world. Now, the CEO leading this global multi-billion dollar company with more than 100,000 employees is Hans Vestberg. He has worked at Ericsson his entire career and has held senior positions in the firm's operations in Sweden, Brazil, Chile, China, Mexico, and the US. In 2010, he was named CEO. In 2011, Fierce Wireless named Hans one of the most powerful people in wireless. 
An innovator in HDTV and 3DTV, Ericsson just won its third Emmy Award for technology. The award will be presented to them here at the 2012 CES in conjunction with ESPN's 3D network. Hans is also on the cover of CEA's Vision Magazine this month, where you can read about this extraordinary company and its extraordinary leader. Please join me in welcoming Hans Vesberg for his first CES keynote to talk about his vision of the networked society. Thank you, Jason. So glad you're here. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's just great to be here, and uh, first of all, we're so proud of Ericsson to be able to be here today to address the most important audience in the consumer electronics world. And uh, for us... All right, and, I'm, and he of course goes on, and I'm now going to jump to a section where he presents a movie. So it's going to be a movie in a movie uh, about... Uh, contributions Ericsson has made. Five billion US dollars a year in research and development in order to understand the network and coming out with technology that actually can support what is happening in the networks together with operators. Let's take a look what is happening a little bit during the 135 years that Ericsson has been around. Lars Magnus Ericsson believed that communications are a basic human need. Back in 1876, this was a radical thing to say. He wanted everyone to benefit from the chance to communicate, wherever they were in the world. We started with the telegraph, then made things more personal with the telephone. For the first time, someone could communicate with another person in another place, in real time. Some phones even became design icons. Others found a place in homes across the world. 1981, we were the first to take things mobile. Enabling you to call a person rather than a place. We believed in mobile broadband and made it happen. So that sharing video, images, and playing games were possible wherever we happened to be. Transforming the way we live, work, and play. We created a programming language that we open sourced. Enabling real-time chat on the world's largest social network. And soon new communities were popping up everywhere. Let's not forget Bluetooth, that was us too. We've tackled extreme projects in the most challenging conditions, such as... To us who work with Erlang, this, this was actually really, really awesome to, uh, to have our programming language mentioned by the Ericsson CEO at such a big event. Because, of course, uh, previously that Ericsson products have been developed in Erlang has not been communicated uh, out to the customers. And uh, I, I really see no problem with that because the telecom customers does not care whether it's programmed in Erlang or Java or C++ uh, or whatever. But... Uh, now, obviously, uh, Ericsson is um, communicating about Erlang uh, much, much more. Uh, there is uh, something called the Consumer Laboratory. It is a um, kind of an uh, exhibition for customers. And now we're talking about operator customers coming to Ericsson. Uh, I haven't had time to go and visit it myself, but uh, rumors claim that there actually is Erlang code on the floor in this exhibition. So, I dare answer the question with, does Erlang has a future? Yes, it definitely has. And 
Ericsson is caring about Erlang more than ever. Thank you.